Welcome back to another edition of the Baseball Talk Radio Show. I'm Gary Mack, and I'm joined as usual when when uh, we're both here, of course. Uh, Mr. Rich Baxter. Rich, uh, how are you this week? Top of the day to you, Gary. Doing well. How about yourself? Welcome back. I'm glad you hear you're feeling better. I'm feeling better. Thank you so much. And what a terrific job you did uh, in my stead. And uh, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, had, you know, it's one of the problems of getting old, you get a little aches and pains and little weird things happen. And uh, but you try to soldier on. So I'm back feeling better. Thank you. And uh, Rich, uh, Nothing going on, and yet a lot of stuff happened. Yeah, yeah, we got locked out of the place. Uh, the players did anyway. <laughs> uh, what a terrible way to start the holiday season for them. It's uh, December 5th as we're doing this podcast. 20 days till Christmas, and the doors have been locked by the owners. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, some of those free agents, though, got snuck in the underneath before the deadline so they'll have a merry christmas but um yeah first time in what uh, 26 years or so that there's been a lockout and a work stoppage in the game of baseball and um you know we're here about the money again and you gotta wonder will there be a 2022 season yeah we'll know uh, as the time draws uh, closer to the season but um yeah it's a long time in between work stoppages as well uh the last time was 94 there was a strike by the players and then before that it was 1990 so the 90s seemed to be not good for baseball and in 94 we lost a lot of fans and they still haven't been back i haven't seen some of them fans uh come back into the fold um, after that strike because, you know, a lot of people don't have sympathy for, you know, players that are making a lot of money. They see, you know, these contracts, especially leading up to the week that uh, the lockout happened, uh, what, $2 billion in contracts? Wow. It was really crazy. Yeah, the union, uh, you know, talks about how they're concerned about free agency going away and yet it was uh reborn if you will in this negotiation when uh, before this negotiation when all of these uh, uh free agent contracts were signed and and uh, uh not the cheesy ones either i might add and um but that's the game. That's the market. And teams made uh, quite a splash. A couple of teams. Uh, my Mets made quite a splash before the uh, CBA expired, signing four free agents, like bang, 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 right in a row. Uh, and, of course, they signed um, Stalling Marte and Eduardo Escobar and Mark Canha. And, of course, the big one was uh, Max Scherzer getting the 37-year-old former Cy Young, multiple Cy Young Award winner, uh, you know, on the pitching staff. But Texas made quite a splash as well. The Texas Rangers and uh, Seattle signed some free agents. And the uh, Los Angeles Angels and Anaheim, or whatever their name is this week, they made a, a splash signing a couple of of pitchers, so um, a lot of a lot of money being spent, and it almost kind of you know if you hear the 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 players union whine about free agency, this particular season uh, kind of takes away from that. Yeah, and the overall average salary for the MLB player apparently went down. I'm not sure how much it went down to, but they're still available to uh, go down to the grocery store, have a nice house, uh, that sort of thing. So again, a lot of people aren't going to feel sorry for these guys that are playing a kid's game, quote unquote, on the big stage and uh, complaining about it. But uh, as you said, 
Texas Rangers going hog wild. What a half a billion dollars on two players. He must be nuts. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's the market, and either the market's going to fall out or it's going to keep going. And uh, you know, as you said in the beginning, though, it's it's hard to have sympathy for really either side. You got billionaire owners and million, you know, millionaire players arguing about uh, uh, money. But, uh, you know, this time, I don't know. I, I, I'm i going to say I understand both sides, but I, I got to think the owners are in the right this time. And only because, you know, they're coming off the pandemic and and they, they came without a year of... Uh, of fans in the seat, which is revenue. I mean, let's face it. And uh, baseball came back strong last year. They they really uh, had a good season. There were a lot of fannies in the seats. And, uh, you know, now for the players to let this agreement expire and, and be so firm on their opposition to certain things and the owners did make proposals they proposed the universal dh they proposed a new lottery uh, system type of thing for the draft um they they even proposed a new free agent thing which we've discussed in the past based on age and you know you could uh, argue it, it you know it works out for the owners more than the players uh, but at least it's something that they propose to negotiate. And the players have seemed to be rather set in what they proposed and don't want to make any changes. There has to be something they give somewhere along the line. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like they're really that uh, far apart as far as certain things. But yet, you know, the players feel that teams are taking advantage of certain players that are very good, keeping them under wraps, club control, that sort of thing. And I can almost see the players um, apprehension about that, you know, teams keeping guys under wraps far too long in order to keep them for that extra year when they're a little bit older. And that, that I think is dirty pool uh, on the behalf of, of teams. So that I think could be straightened up. Uh, I don't know how you would straighten it up though, without uh, changing that rule on the amount of years before you could be a free agent. Yeah. Uh, and, or do away with that super two thing. Um, if they change it to an age base, I, I think that you would see uh, probably a lot, uh, uh, a lot of these younger guys that they do hold back, they probably let go because they know they have them for a certain amount of time. Um, I, you know, I mean, there are some things I agree with the players don't like. Uh, that being one uh, service time thing. But what's fair? I mean, that's the tough part, you know. If you bring up a guy at 19 and then lose him at 23... Is that fair? Or if you bring up a guy that blooms at 22 and then you only get him for a year after you, he may have been in your, you, you know, after you've drafted him and and have progressed him through the minors for two, two years or three years, you, you've made this investment and then you have him for a year and then he can walk. So that's not fair to the owners either. Um, I, you know, I don't know what, what the correct thing is um unless you do an age thing and tie it with a uh 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 some sort of service time thing like you know let's say 27 but you have to have three years with a team or something um i what's the current now six years i think for free agency yeah. maybe maybe the maybe maybe the player uh or the owners got to come down a year you know, make it five. Uh, I mean, they've got to get something on their investment. Let's let's be honest about that. Even the union's got to recognize that. Uh, they just can't 
let a guy come up and, and then be gone after a year, you know. Uh, so, I, 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 yeah, I'm with you. I don't know what all the answers are. There are issues on both sides that uh, the uh, – I know the union's concerned about teams not um, – uh, not uh, spending enough money. Some of the lower teams and collecting money and not spending it. And, and I think the owners proposed a floor in spending, which means you'd have to spend that amount of money on your team. So, um, But the players don't seem to be interested in that. They want to do something else, which, I, you know, I can't remember the details right this instant but it didn't sound like it was going to help that situation it didn't help didn't sound like it was going to help the game so um but i guess we wait and see what happens uh while uh you know they're not even negotiation they got to get something at the table i thought the funny thing was rich that um the players didn't seem too concerned about it that you know they they knew they had this date of December 1st and they didn't really think of it as a, you know, anything to worry about. They said they would worry about it as they get closer to uh, uh, spring training, which would probably be February 1st or so. Usually spring training is around the 14th. Um, so I think the players aren't too concerned until it hits, uh, I'll say mid-January, then they'll start to get concerned a little bit. Yeah, yeah. What that looming no paycheck type of situation. You know, these guys have gone out and, you know, bought things and live in big houses and have to pay for it. So <laughs> when that happens, <laughs> it's going to hit home pretty hard. So, uh to get back to your comment about the uh, the attendance, I didn't read anything till now that you said about the attendance, but actually the attendance went down uh, in 2021. A lot of fans grew um, grew away from the game a little bit. I don't know if they'll come back in 2022, but uh, viewership was down. I said 30 30 percent over comparison of 2019. 33 percent so that's a it's a lot of fans that you know for whatever reason did not come back and watch baseball in the stadiums i was one of them i i just didn't feel like going last year um for whatever reason and uh stayed away but you know viewership was down as well 10 12 percent from 2019 a full season maybe yeah. it's the it's the COVID type of uh, lingering uh, cloud over some of these sports. And, um, you know, baseball has to be careful. They don't want to lose even more fans. Well, I think you hit, it to know, uh, hit the nail on the head. I think it was uh, the reason they, w they deemed it successful was that they did get as many people back as they – were able to after not having anybody and and I think the numbers drop is because of COVID I think there's a lot of people I know I did not go to a game and mostly because of COVID that I, I didn't want to take the chance yeah. so I think there's a lot of that uh, and I think uh, that's why this is so ill-timed had this happened next year it might have been better you would have got a better picture in 2022 if people were coming back the further we get away from 2020 um i think viewership is down in all sports because people found other stuff to watch yeah during the covid you know so um i i, I think uh that's that's uh that and and you're right they have to be very careful that they don't lose people that that normally would come back and or just get disgusted over millionaires arguing about money and um but you know one thing too rich with this is from the last work stoppage to this work stoppage there's been a big turnover in owners as well and 
uh, a lot of them are younger. A lot of them are um, have other jobs for for lack of a better term. You know, it's not the uh, um, the they're not making a livelihood off of the baseball. They have other business interests that. You know, they're billionaires in uh, Take the Mets and Steve Cohen now. He's a day trader or, or uh, a, 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 I shouldn't say that. That's not what he is. He's he's, a, he's involved in the stock market. I don't know what the, a hedge fund operator, that's what it is, a hedge fund. And uh, so he's making billions, whereas this is more... Uh, not not his main business, and there's a lot of owners like that now. So they may not be prepared to cave as quickly either as as it happened in the past. So it's going to be an interesting thing to watch and see um, when they start to negotiate again. But uh, other things do go on, Rich, as uh, uh, as this season progresses and this off season progresses and, and we see what happens with the CBA, uh, though teams are not allowed to trade, they're not allowed to talk to uh, free agents, they're not allowed to extend contracts. Uh, the Rule 5 draft has been suspended and, and other things, but um, minor leagues are, are allowed to go on. They can hold mini camps and everything, so I think you'll see a lot more um, intensity, if you will, uh, put on the minor leagues. and uh, Also, a couple of teams still looking for managers, and they're allowed to do that. Yeah, the business of baseball still can go on, except for the teams contacting the players, and players can't use the facilities, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it must be an eerie silence between player and team now. <laughs> Um, we saw them take away their pictures on the MLB website and, you know, in years past, we didn't notice these things because quite frankly, the internet isn't what it was back in 94, as it is now, you didn't have Twitter. You didn't have all this social commentary, uh, that was public and, um, you know, it's a, it's a new world for a work stoppage like this with baseball even. Yeah, so true. So true. Uh, and social media and all the other things have really made a difference in uh, how things are reported and, and uh, all sorts of things. But uh, we shall see, uh, you know, as things go on. And, and today on December 5th, Rich, of course, is the uh, voting takes place for the Hall of Fame early baseball era committee and the golden days era committee will meet to vote on 10 player ballots. So um, tonight at 6 p.m. on MLB Network, we'll get the results of that. Here in New York, we are hoping that Gil Hodges gets a look-see and uh, finally gets into the Hall of Fame. But, um, oh, you know... You don't know. The, the problem with this committee is I don't think there's anybody that played with some of these guys anymore on them. And, uh, you know, that that's that's a difficult thing. They're going to want to get the guys that they played with they, they think should be in it. Yeah, it's going to be um, interesting. And as you said, each individual city has guys that, probably would make the hall of fame or should have made the hall of fame, but didn't. And, um, in the Philadelphia area, it's, um, uh, Richie, um, God, I forgot his last name, Richie Allen, of course, <laughs> yeah. but, um, yeah, they've been trumpeting his name all week on radio, uh, Mike Schmidt making, uh, the rounds calling people that are going to be voting and apparently the votes already in, but, um, John Heyman reporting on different guys that he would have voted for things like that. So it'll be interesting to see who gets in, but you know, this is not like the regular hall of fame. This is a special committee. Um, 
that are going to vote this in. So it'll be interesting, but, you know, not like the big one, of course. Right. And that takes place, I think, in uh, when is it January they announced that and uh, lots of uh, lots of candidates up for that award uh, as well this year. And uh, I think Alex Rodriguez might be one of them. So there'll be some uh, interesting things to see on that ballot as we uh, get to that. I'm just trying to see. When that is the official date, they'll they'll announce it. I think it says, let's see here, January twenty fifth, twenty twenty two. Yeah, it's in, yeah, it's in something like that. And it, it's interesting that there's some big names that are in their final year of eligibility, and who would have thought? The boy, are we getting old, or am I getting old? Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Kurt Schilling, Sammy Sosa are in their 10th and final year of BBWAA eligibility, which means they've been out 15 years already. Holy cow. That's a lot. First Where has the time gone? <laughs> yeah, it'll be uh, A-Rod, as you said, will be a first timer. Um Mark Texiera, Jonathan Papelbon will be on, on there. Tim Lincecum, Ryan Howard, Prince Fielder, Carl Crawford. Some of those names. Uh, interesting to see what happens with them. Jimmy Rollins. Yeah, I'd, I never thought of Jimmy Rollins as a Hall of Famer, but he did a lot during his career. Um how do you feel about Rollins in the hall? I I don't think he's got the the stats to be honest. Um a lot of these guys make the list because they, you know, certain reasons and and uh um Big Poppy's going to be on so everybody's going to vote for him probably even though A he was a DH for most of his career and there's been questions of him about steroids. So I, I think if he gets in, I think you've got a, you've seen a trend that, that uh, you know, why aren't some of these other guys in the Barry Bonds or Roger Clemens? Um, Jimmy Rollins was in, in a nice player, uh, but I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't think he's a Hall of Famer. 43 now. Jeez, time is uh, moving on. <laughs> 43 years of age. He had one of those long careers, though, the 17-year career. Guys like Ryan Howard and other um, folks weren't brought up as early as Rollins, so they, they couldn't put those years in like Rollins did. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, but it's not about longevity, they keep telling us. It's... it's uh, that's the dichotomy, though, isn't it? Yeah. They say it's not about longevity. They get on, uh, um, Don Sutton, they used to get on, they used to call him a compiler because he hung around and, and put up numbers to get his 300 wins. Yeah. But then they'll turn around and say, well, he didn't have enough years at a certain level of, of play. So what is it? You know, you can't have both. Uh, you know, a guy like uh, Sutton's going to, if he can hang around, he can hang around. What's wrong with that? If a team's willing to pay him money and keep him around and he's putting numbers together, what's the difference, I think, you know? Um, and he did have, he, he dominated and whatnot. Um, I, I think, the problem with a guy like Rollins is he's, he never won an MVP. I, th I think you should have to win an MVP. Well, I I take that back because it's not – you can be a Hall of Fame player and, and it just doesn't work out where you get an MVP. But um, Now, he did get it in 07. Oh, he did get an MVP. Okay, so I'll, yeah. I'll uh, change that. And um, he, I he, don't know. I just think – his numbers aren't there. Two sixty-four lifetime average. 
He's got some numbers on baseball-reference.com. They have a Hall of Fame statistics type of thing that compares um, numbers that the players have with Hall mm -hmm. of Famers. The thing that he's got going for him is he was a shortstop. And as you can see, similar batters here. Some of these guys became Hall of Famers. Barry Larkin, yeah. Roberto Alomar, Sandberg, um, Joe Morgan. So he's sort of on that edge, so to speak. You can look right. at these numbers. Yeah. Um, well, we'll see. He's very close. I mean... It would be good for him if he were to, to get it. I, I don't know. I don't know if you could consider him a Hall of Famer. I mean, certainly for the Phillies, he was aces over his career. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this vote this year. Now, a guy like Tim Lincecum is up, and, and you know, he, he's, got this, he's got the issues of where – he didn't do it long enough, but he won what two, two or three Cy Youngs, a uh, couple of them back to back, deserved it, dominated. But the body of work isn't there, so I, you know, that's a tough call there. But I don't think he should. I don't think he gets in because of the body of work wasn't just wasn't enough. Uh, I would have said that uh, he was a definite Hall of Famer when he was in his prime. Yeah, but, it certainly seemed like it. Yeah, but the injuries came in and and took hold, and, and you know. Um, and let's face it, though, we're never going to see a 300-game uh, a, a winner. I mean, that's going to be very rare. I mean, one of the, he, we played ten years, yeah, and he had some. I don't know. I I think because his last few years, and he retired early, I guess. Well, or he was forced to retire. Um, I think that's gonna hurt him. Yeah, I don't uh, think he was a good, very good pitcher, but I don't see him as a hall of famer yeah 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 now a guy like max scherzer and not because he's playing with the mets now but i think uh i think he's a definite hall of famer when you look at his numbers yeah um and uh at 37 he's still pitching and pitching at a very high level and uh so I, I that's the kind of guy, and I don't see anybody that compares with that in this class. Uh, a lot of these guys, you know, you look at them and you say, well, he was a really good player, but, you know, Justin Morneau, terrific player. Had a lot of injuries, though, curtailed his career. So does he belong in the Hall of Fame? I, I don't think so. Papelbon, uh you know, had some big years, but then kind of just faded away. Yeah. Um, Ryan Howitt's an interesting case. The problem with, with Howard's going to be as a power hitter, there's certain numbers that they compare to power, hit, power hitters. And I'm not sure if he, he's going to make that criteria. How long did he play? 10, 10 years, 12 years? think it was let me bring him up on the screen here oh um, 13 years oh okay and but he's, the he, last year was what 112 games so yeah maybe you rookie know he hit 25 year. home runs that year yeah rookie of the year mvp and he was close on mvp a couple other times uh, let's look at his numbers Hall of Fame wise, though. He's got 382 homers. That's going to hurt him, I think. Yeah, if you look at, you know, what Baseball Reference calls Hall of Fame statistics, he's with those group of players that were really great, mm -hmm. but just didn't get into the but, hall. Nah, just below that level. 
Yeah. If anything, I think between he and Jimmy Rollins, it would probably be Rollins. Rollins that would... got a better shot, yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll have something to discuss as we go along. <laughs> yes, indeed. And another uh, surprise emerged this past week in the news. Um, a website called uh, Business Insider had a report about the MLB using two different baseballs throughout the 2021 season without the knowledge of players or teams. The report drew from research of a person named Meredith Wills. She is astrophysicist and data scientist who in recent years had conducted her own independent studies of baseballs used in major league games. So in a statement, the league acknowledged that it used two different baseballs and blamed differences on production difficulties caused by the pandemic. So uh, was it something that they calculated on or was it just that uh, certain balls had to be made a year in advance before they're used for whatever reason? And uh, that wasn't done due to the pandemic. So. Mm -hmm. But interesting news, nonetheless, about interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, that the MLB didn't come right out and say it. Oh, by the way, we're using two different. <laughs> <laughs> and if you recall, though, a lot of the pitchers complained about it, said they, they're using different balls. They could feel it in the seams and uh, whatnot. So the pitchers knew, the, ball, the players knew, sort of, uh, unofficially, um, but uh, now, now it it comes out that they did indeed use two different balls. So, um, I, you know, they keep messing with everything, Rich. I just leave stuff alone. They keep messing with the balls. Now all these ballparks are getting humidors, and uh, yeah, just just leave the ball alone. Leave the game alone. It's it's just. It's yeah. it's disheartening sometimes. Yeah, they're tinkering around with it uh, quite a bit, and uh, yeah, that's evolution of some games. Uh, we take hockey. You know, it seems like half the hockey league gets into the playoffs. Basketball, the same thing. Baseball, talking about wanting to do the same thing. Do you, do you really think an 85 win team or 84, 83 win team should be in the playoffs? Well, if it's your home team, you're going <laughs> to say yes. And, uh, you know, if that's the way they want to go, um, look, I hate to keep going back to the Mets, but in 1973, the Mets got in with 83 wins and then the uh, I think it was 83 or 82 wins that year and they won their division they blew away the uh big red machine who had won over 100 games and uh got into the world series and almost defeated the Oakland Athletics who were in the middle at that time of a uh you know a historic run so you know, I don't know if you can always go by wins. Look at the Atlanta Braves. They had the least uh, wins this year and yet dominated in the playoffs and went all the way. So um, I, I, I think because baseball is such a long season that, that uh, it, it's hard to say, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a marathon, and who stays the healthiest and who or who gets healthy at the right time can win it. So, um, though, am I in favor of 14 teams being in the playoffs? No. Um, I, I, I think it's too much. It waters down the competition a little bit. and But it does give it does give hope to that 85 win team. And maybe I, I, I think part of the theory is that if, 
if you can get in with an 83-85 win team, that maybe that'll give you an incentive, give that team an incentive. Let's let's say a Pittsburgh or something. If they can get in and get a playoff game in, it may give them the incentive to spend a little bit more money on a free agent or something like that to try to get that next level. Maybe it's a pitcher that they need or or uh, you know another bat or whatever. And I think that's the theory behind it. I don't want to see, you know, playoffs going on in November or December though. That's that's the other part of it. They they have to find a way to if they're going to do that, then they've either got to shorten the regular season um cuz I don't want to see any more snow outs either in March. You know what I mean? Or play uh, some double headers. Yeah, play double headers and get the season over with quicker. And uh, there's no way, reason why they can't end the season in the middle of September with double headers. And um, and just you got to cut down on the travel days too in the playoffs. You know, just make that. We said in 2020 how how cool it was when they played. They were in a, in a set location. They were in a bubble. I get it, but they played. Were playing every day. I think just about. And I I think it was better for the game at that point because people didn't have to. You know. Oh, uh, you know. You build up. You have a terrific game. Let, let's say game two or game five is so terrific, and then there's an off day for travel. And then it kind of lets the air out of the balloon for game six. You know, um, the intensity gets lost. So, but I don't know what you do about that. If you've got a New York and Los Angeles playoff, uh, you know, that's rough on the players as well. So, I, you know, I guess that's why we're here doing this, Rich, and, and not making these kind of decisions because they're tough decisions. Yeah. We'll see uh, what they decide, um, hopefully soon, um, coming to an agreement. But, um, hey, a name from the past surfaced up this past week as well. Dice K, Daiseku Matsuzaka. I remember him when uh, he was brought over from Japan, made a big splash into the major leagues, just retired from baseball after a 23-year career. That's a long, long career. Yeah, I think um, that includes Japan, though. Yeah, a lot of um, a lot of his career was in Japan. Forty-one years old. Yeah, uh, and he got a surprise by uh, Ichiro, who came out unannounced and uh, gave him a bouquet of flowers. It really uh, made an impact on uh, Matsuzaka there. Well, I don't know if Matsuzaka is going to make the Hall of Fame, but I think Ichiro will definitely be a Hall of Famer for uh uh in in cooperstown uh i don't think there's any uh question about that but um yeah i mean pretty neat that uh he was there to uh for the uh his countryman's uh retirement and Dice K had some good years here in in uh, Boston as well with the uh, won some world championships. So, uh, you know, forty one, he'll have a nice career, nice life in in uh, Japan. When, home in Japan, he'll probably, uh, if he wants to, go over to coach or uh, who knows. But uh, uh, congratulations on his retirement. Yeah, one of those big names in Japanese baseball. Of course, Ichiro as well. Yeah, I think he's going to be an instant Hall of Famer for sure. And uh, it'll be interesting to see that Hall of Fame vote this year. There's a lot of new names in there, a lot of old names, like you said, that are going to be going by the wayside too. And uh, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, we certainly will. Uh Kurt Schilling, I think, should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, I, You know, as much as I'm against Bonds and Clemens and what they did, but 
I, you know, it's getting to the point. They played him in. Well, you know, I mean, I think the argument right there is you got a pitcher and a hand a home run hitter, and they both got uh, tainted by steroids. So if they're both tainted, that means you don't know what pitchers were doing it and what hitters were doing it. So every if everybody was doing it or, or nine-tenths of the people or eight, 80% of the people were doing it, then it almost was, you know, I, I don't want to say it was a level playing field, but if if pitchers were doing it and hitters were doing it, then I I think you got, I you know I think you got to let them in. I think and and I was adamant against it, but you know, I, yeah, I I still say. You can't do it. I mean, there, there's artificial strength going on, extended careers going on um, illegally. I, yes. I just, I just don't see how you could vote them in when they had the the advantage, even though, like you said, it was kind of widespread. You got so many names, though. Are you going to vote them all in or does half of them get in? McGuire. uh the rocket, uh, all these guys that are implicated in this, and do they all get in or do they all not get in? I, I think you have to look at, you know, Le Clemens was a Hall of Famer before he got involved in all of this stuff, as far as we know. Uh, Bonds was a, heading to the Hall of Fame before he got involved in this stuff. Uh, you know, Sammy Sosa wasn't. I don't. He didn't have that kind of career. His career took off, and uh, though one could make the argument that him and McGuire saved baseball after the 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 last lockout with their pennant, you know, in their home run races. So there's that. Um, McGuire, I think he's a borderline. Um, but I think if you look at a guy like Clemens and you look at a guy like Bonds, they were whole, they were great ball players before all of this stuff came out, and and there was no indication nobody's ever said that they did this at a young age. Um, so I I think that has to be taken into consideration. Um, you know, is a guy like Big Poppy? Is he? He's going to go in, and yet he's got some taint. Uh, you know, his name is tainted with steroids as well, and he wasn't a big-name player before, you know, he got to Boston, really. He had so-so years in Texas. And uh, so I, I think you have to consider, I, I think when it, when it comes to, a, a you know, like a Bonds, a Clemens, even an A-Rod, and believe me, I can't stand these guys. <laughs> I I just they're arrogant. They you know, I, and what they did wasn't right. But you know, again, what's performance enhancing? It it it's so tough to define nowadays because uh, you could actually you could make the argument that a, a Tylenol is performance enhancing. If a guy's got a bad headache and he, he, you know, he takes a couple of Tylenol and the headache goes away, is that considered performance enhancing? Um, you know, is is uh, a blue emu rub? Is that, you know, a guy's got a sore knee and he rubs it on? Is, is a whirlpool considered performance enhancing because it helps loosen up your muscles or whatever? I. I just and and I know that's a, it. It's all a stretch. I get it. It it's not as bad as what um, the you know what they these guys did. But for Pete's sake, you turn on the TV and you can buy you and growth hormone not in the amounts or the probably the uh, uh, you know the dosage that these guys did. 
But you got Frank Thomas, the the big hurt, advertising for Nugenics or whatever they call it, on on TV with Doug Flutie, and that's it's essentially human growth hormone in smaller doses. But it's the same thing, you know. And so I I I I just think the world's gone so nuts with with everything that it's time to open it up and let him in and but pete rose should be in as well yeah uh the all-time hit leader i mean if you're gonna you know uh have draft king commercials during your ball game the whole time and then in a pregame show have things sponsored by draft kings and give out odds of the game or or certain players picking you know uh, uh, who's gonna make some money for you during this game then I, you know, then you got to look at, at a guy like Pete Rose and say, you know, we got to let him in. That's true. So we'll have to see what happens uh, with this vote and um, coming up over the winter season here and 20 more days for Christmas. So you have some shopping days left to get out there. Maybe you have a baseball <laughs> fan in mind, you know, one your family member, maybe we'll get him a hat or jersey of some sort got plenty of time to do it yeah i'm i'm done <laughs> i'm done with my christmas shopping how about you i'm i'm getting there i like the last minute type stuff a little bit so i'll uh you know i started real early and uh, like september october i'll get a couple things put them away and then i'll leave the rest for you know around the hustle bustle of the season but uh <laughs> yeah it's been uh been a nice off season so far except for the strike and um hopefully it doesn't spoil the plans of the spring training people i see you know millions of people flock down there for i don't know about millions but a lot of people flock down there to florida yeah. and arizona for spring training so i hope that plan doesn't get derailed for people and um just want to wish our listeners a happy holiday season out there already. Um, the Hanukkah is in full bloom, I think still. Yeah. Um, and Christmas coming up and uh, then New Year's again. It starts all again. Yep. And uh, we will be here to report whatever, whatever we can report. Yes, we, got <laughs> some, we had some good topics this week and uh, we, Hope to have a lot more for you going on. Don't forget, give us an email if you like. Rich at BaseballTalkRadio.com. Gary over at Gary at BaseballTalkRadio.com. And he also does the Mets Musings podcast. You can go to BaseballTalkRadio.com. See the Phillies Talk podcast. That's mine. Just did a fresh episode the other day. And um, we're going to have a lot more podcasts on that network as well. So tune in. Yeah, I can't wait to see what else you got up your sleeve, Rich. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, it was a pleasure being back with you, Rich. And I think we're going to wrap up this one. And if you'd like to help out the show, you can by going to anchor.fm slash baseball talk radio show and uh, it'll uh, there's a support button there and you can give us uh, some help if you choose to right through the uh, host page or you can go to our patreon page at patreon.com patreon.com forward slash baseball talk and don't forget we have a facebook page it's facebook.com baseball talk radio show and uh, anything you can help us with would be, you know, greatly uh, uh, appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Rich, have a good week, and, and uh, I'll talk to you again next week. Yep. Take care, everyone.